to begin uh, with, I would like just to uh, let you know that tomorrow I will give uh, to all of you a, a short bi bibliography of book that I recommend, uh, linked to the subject that we are discussing today, yesterday, and tomorrow. But in addition, if you want more, uh, I mean, more general bibliography sources, especially uh, internet statistic, where you can get accurate numbers, figures, uh, depending on the countries that you are interested in. Uh, there is on my website, uh, which is smart2014.com, uh, there is an English uh, section. And in the English section, there is a section that is called books. And on that section, there is the smart, so the book that I wrote on the internet. And you will have there a uh, sources document. It's a PDF. You can download it. And there is a 41 pages of uh, uh, references uh, by on every subject on the internet, statistics, uh, international statistics, internet statistics, and many uh, information that you can get if you need anything uh, more uh, substantial than what I'm saying today. Uh, once again, once again, when you wrote a long research, a long book, it's difficult to, to summarize everything. But with this kind of bibliography, which is in English, you can get more uh, information, you can go to whatever is more interesting for you, get to to have more accurate uh, uh, number and, and, and things like that. So smart2014.com, uh, I think it works also with .fr, uh, and it's a, it's a website dedicated to the book. It's in French, but there is a, a, an English section, and everything then I is in English. Okay, uh, yesterday we, we were, uh, I was doing like some generalization about uh, uh, the US, China, and also uh, uh, my hypothesis about the future, if I can say that, future of the internet, fragmentation, uh, the need of regulation, uh, and so on and so forth. Today I would like to focus on two single aspects. And during the first hour, I will focus on smart cities. And in the second hour, I will focus on revitalization. Revitalization is difficult to say for a Frenchman. Revitalization en français. So in English, uh, how do you revitalize uh, area like slums and bidonville, uh, ghetto, zona of miseria, you say, I think, in Mexican, uh, favelas in Brazil, um, ghettos, townships. Uh, through the internet. So the two subjects are kind of linked because they are both linked to urban cities. But in one side, it's more like the rich side of the debate, and the second part is more um, like the poor area. Um, so I'm beginning by the rich, but I don't know if, it's, uh, if it's, uh, there is any order on that. So basically, um, I'm going to focus, first of all, uh, about uh, smart cities. Smart cities have been, for a while, a pretty um, I mean, general uh, term that we use, even though we don't necessarily know what we put behind the smart city uh, concept. I'm not going to go for a long time on definitions, because I think uh, uh, example will be more uh, interesting to uh, for, for you, but I can say that there is two ways of thinking a smart city. First of all, you have a city that already exists and you want it to be smart. Then the idea is more a smarter city. And then there is also a new city that you are going to build uh, from scratch. Uh, and then it's a new city. And this is really a smart city. Uh, for now, we don't really have smart cities. In general, it's more smarter city. But we have some areas that became smart cities when government, sometimes uh, industries, decided to create a place, an area. And I know there is one that is a project for a long time. Like uh, uh, It's like a, w a white tiger, like something that uh, maybe never exists. But uh, a white elephant, sorry, white elephant. Uh, here in Guadalajara, but uh, this uh, 
with, with some example, we will see how sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and my main, uh, main topic of today is why it works sometimes and why it uh, doesn't work. I'm going to begin with one uh, example, uh, which is in India, in uh, Bangalore. Uh, you know the city has a new name, we say now Bengaluru, B-E-N-G-A-L-O-O-R-U, because in India in general now we use the, the former names be before of the, they want to, it's like uh, uh, Mumbai, Mumbai and not Bombay. Uh, I mean, every city has a new name. So basically, Bangalore becomes uh, Bengaluru. Um, and uh, um, the, the story of uh, Bengaluru, it's basically, again, a, a place where the army was pretty strong. Uh, it's very far away from Pakistan, so the idea is to have like uh, military research and military, uh, I mean, different things set up uh, in a city far away from Pakistan. And for a very long time, at least since the, the Second World War, they have put there a lot of military uh, school and military research and so on and so forth. Step by step, uh, uh, they uh, created there also uh, some, some company that were basically what I can call the back office of the American uh, Silicon Valley and the American economy. Uh, Infosys, Wipro, uh, Samsung, Tata, Motorola, HP, Siemens, all of these companies built their, I would say, uh, call center, outsourcing center, uh, back office center there in uh, Ben. Bengaluru. By the way, it's not very original to create a, s a smart city. Everywhere in the world today, in every big uh, city, in every capital, uh, in London, in Madrid, in Barcelona, in Paris, in Berlin, uh, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, everybody wants to create a smart city. So if in Guadalajara they want to do that, it's not very original. It had been made everywhere in the last 10 or 15 years. In general, the idea is to concentrate in a city or in, in a neighborhood uh, three kind of things. The academic, the corporation, and some government institution and fundings. So this is the model with the three big uh, industry altogether. The academic, the industry, startups, and big corporations, and the government. Of course, the model everywhere in the world, it's the Silicon Valley. Everywhere they want to create a new Silicon Valley, and uh, quite often they use actually the, the word. They say th this is like, uh, as I said, for Chile, the Silicon Valley. Sometimes they say uh, it's uh, um, they will use uh, like the Silicon Valley of Latin America, or they will use uh, the expression in a way or in another, even though when it's not a valley at all, when it's a mountain or something like that, it can be a little bit crazy sometimes to use Silicon Valley expression. In a large, uh, I mean, I, I do think that recreating the Silicon Valley is by definition a mistake. Uh, for many reasons, the Silicon Valley is something extremely singular, extremely specific, and that you cannot recreate. And I'm going to try to explain why through a certain number of examples. To go back on the Bengaluru uh, story, basically, at the beginning, it was a call center. So basically, you get the youth, uh, the Indians, that are uh, in Asia among the people that speak English pretty well with Singapore and Hong Kong, basically. So they were uh, all night long uh, and all day long also sometimes working on answering a phone call from the US about everything that can work uh, in a, 
with some problems in, uh, in the US. So uh, it could be like uh, social security payment for health uh, uh, care. It could be insurance, it could be banking, it could be uh, uh, how to repair or to make uh, uh, your computer working well and so on and so forth. So it has been the case for a very long time. Uh, and more or less, they also develop uh, many um, outsourcing and offshoring for, uh, I would say, a lot of uh, um, how you develop uh, code, how you develop uh, many uh, uh, software and uh, things that were necessary and very time consuming and so very expensive. Uh, in, in India, they say in general, China has the hardware, India has the software. So they were doing basically the software and uh, with through outsourcing and offshoring, they were uh, pretty strong and Enfosys or Wipro, for example, are extremely big company in India uh, based uh, in Bangalore. They, uh, when, when you go to the campus of Infosys, it's a bit like, like this one actually, it's like a university campus, bigger one, I think they have 22,000 uh, employees on the campus and you have also a, a swimming pool, a library, uh, uh, tons of restaurants and, uh, and parks and trees and <coughs> Starbucks coffee like here and so on and so forth. And in, in, in Bangalore, it's like an extremely rich campus in comparison with the slums that are just three or four miles uh, away. And Infosys, which became like the model of this uh, Indian uh, development, uh, has, uh, has been uh, an extremely uh, uh, symbolic place and success of the Indian economy. Today, uh, the, I would say the smart city of Bengaluru is also changing. They, need, uh, they still need to be the back office of the American, uh, I would say, uh, economy. At the same time, more competition comes from countries where the minimum wage is even lower. lower. So India now it's too expensive in comparison with some other country. So I'm a part of the, just the code, uh, how you develop just basic things uh, all around the clock can be done in cheaper way in other country like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and also Indonesia. So for, for the India, it's a problem. At the same time, they want to be more creative. So they need to stay uh, very active on uh, the supply for, for the US, but they want also to, to be more creative. So for example, they have done video games for a long time there, but uh, basically all the creation process, the marketing process, the promotion has been made in the US and they were just doing the code all night long. Now they wanna be more part of the process of creating. So they come from an internet or a technology which was really uh, just uh, developing technology to a smarter way with more creative process in it. And this is basically the future uh, technology for, uh, for India. What they call SMAC, uh, basically. The, their goal is to go on social media, mobile, analytics, and cloud. What they call SMAC, social media, mobile, analytics, and cloud. Uh, if you look at the, this model, it's a very, I would say, a very singular model. It is not a Silicon Valley made in India. They have done their own things in a very different way than what has been done in the Silicon Valley. They adapt constantly to the Indian model. They try to, to do something that is at the same time uh, useful for, for the US and sometimes for European company, but at the same time being very Indian. And they try also to change their model to adapt to the new uh, order uh, and the new economic trend. And I do think it's very important when you, when you try to build or to create a smart city to keep this extremely influential link to your country to do something that is extremely uh, uh, original for, for yourself. 
I'm going to take a second example now, uh, which is what we call also the Silicon Valley uh, of Israel. Uh, Israel, as you know, is a very small country. It is place center red. It is, it's, it's really in a city and actually in a specific places within the city of Bengaluru. In Israel, it's a little bit everywhere. You have the Technion, which is north of uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, you have startup in Tel Aviv, especially on Rothschild Avenue, which is uh, uh, one of the main beautiful actually uh, avenue in the center of uh, Tel Aviv. But you have also uh, some campuses, uh, the Technion, it's a university north of, uh, uh, I mean, basically in the direction of Haifa, in Haifa. Um, you have also uh, campuses a little bit uh, everywhere in, in, in Israel, it's very, very, very small, so uh, like 20, 20 kilometers from, from Tel Aviv. And they basically um, decided to help startups to grow. Uh, they didn't ask the startup to come in a singular place. They just said, if you uh, are a startup and you need some funding, uh, we are here to help. And so actually the startup uh, mushrooms uh, a little bit everywhere, uh, like, I mean, wherever they wanted, they opened offices and they were uh, funded more or less, uh, depending of the, of the, the their project, their business model. Uh, everywhere they were funded by the, um, the government. And it became what we call today the Startup Nation. Uh, Startup Nation, it's a communication name, but it has been very successful since everywhere in the world we speak about Israel as a Startup Nation. And it's true that there is more startup in Israel than in many other countries uh, around the world, even though they are much bigger. So the, the idea is how you were able to nurture a very, uh, uh, I would say, influential uh, group of startup in a, uh, within uh, concentrating in a specific spa space, but allowing uh, the startup to, uh, to boom uh, with um, this uh, uh, very specific uh, way of doing business in Israel. Many startups from Israel have been bought by a uh, US uh, Silicon Valley uh, company, for example, Waz, or um, many small startups have been bought by uh, Facebook or Google. And it became a pretty successful, successful model uh, that also uh, some other countries try to imitate. My third example will be uh, uh, in Latin America, in Brazil. Uh, in a city named uh, Recife, uh, northeast uh, of Brazil. Uh, and then you have what they have called Porto Digital, basically uh, uh, the digital port. Recife has been for a very long time, um, I would say since probably the beginning of the 19th century, uh, a key place on the on Latin America uh, uh, and South America, uh, a, a very important port. Uh, it has been uh, a place, uh, one of the most influential uh, ports, and uh, business wa was has been done for a long time there. And the interesting thing is that uh, Porto Digital uh, basically grows from this idea of a place. The place was existing for a very long time, then because of the post-industrialization after the Second World War, the, the, all the activities from the port were less efficient, and basically the port died, 
step by step, like many others in the world. And it became such a kind of uh, island, actually it's two islands in the middle of Recif without any activity. So it basically was like a, a decline and without any life. The idea of the uh, of the city of Recife and also from the, the the region, they decided to use this old building from the Port Authority to uh, put some startup there because it was very open for many spaces and uh, and it was actually very beautiful even though it was a little bit in this destruction. Um, and today you can see this old building with the, the old names of the, the, the Port Authority, uh, uh, like from the 19th century of the 20th century, and with the new logo of Google, Apple, uh, in buildings that are totally restored and uh, extremely beautiful. Uh, they have done that step by step, so they create some startups, they invited some startups, then they invited big company, then they open a museum, then they op they try to get some some restaurant and again a Starbucks cafe uh, and uh, uh, and it's like two islands, pretty small but uh, I mean not so small and uh, there is still a lot of building that has to be uh, I would say a restaurant so so for the next 10 years they will work still on that and it, it has been a pretty long project so actually for 10 years and probably for the next 10 years they are step by step taking one building after the other transforming it in a new venue for uh, internet uh, small business or bigger company or and so on and so forth um, if you're interested in this kind of subject uh, i know it's not always easy to travel but I, w I will encourage you to spend like two or three days in these kind of cities. You go to Recife, it's not that, that far, and you see how you are able to recreate a city thanks to the internet. And it works. Um, the city now has plenty of restaurants, uh, plenty of life. A university is, is, is inside, the, the, uh, in the, within the island, and uh, all that take shape step by step <laughs> it's a long process but it uh, it works and i was very impressed actually by how you can regenerate revitalize a city within uh, a few years thanks to the internet and new technologies and once again they use the model of the free mix of academic startup and business and the government but no nowhere the government had the majority of uh, of the decision nowhere the academic had the majority of decision nowhere the startup are the only one to decide it's a constantly exchange between the academic life the government authority and the business people and all that in a very uh, careful way to uh, to be organized and once again if you if you speak, uh, if we think about the Silicon Valley, uh, nobody one day said, okay, we are going to put the Silicon Valley there. You don't, didn't have in the 40s or in the 50s a mayor of San Francisco or the governor of California that would say, okay, we are going to create the Silicon Valley. It's, it doesn't work like that in the US. Actually, it was uh, Eisenhower that created uh, the new highways that were making uh, the, the south of San Francisco uh, more accessible by because of the thanks to the highway and the bellway uh, in interstate uh, in this area. Then the airport of San Francisco has been developed and became a hub for the, for the west part of the country. And then uh, the Castro, as I said yesterday, the Castro, the EP, um, the the folk became like a hub for counterculture and all these kind of things and then cooperation began to arrive and then the mayor uh, put more money on the train and then and so on and so forth so it was a process that nobody really decide but it became after 50 years and of course Stanford University and a little bit Berkeley as well uh, have been part of this incredible model that cannot be replicated because uh, once again, it took 50 years without anyone that really decide
to do that. And this is the kind of miracle of the Silicon Valley. In a way, in Porto Digital, it's still a little bit like that, in a sense that um, they didn't create something from scratch. They really, I mean, it was already, I would say, a, 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 a hub and a web, if I can use the expression, for Latin America. So it was, the place was already uh, important. And they just recreate uh, a business from, from an old business that was dying, uh, the Port Authority, to a new one, which is a, 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 an internet-based uh, hub in, uh, uh, in Brazil. Now I'm going to take uh, two other examples, one in Russia and the other one in Kenya. Uh, and all the cities that are mentioned right now are places where I spend uh, weeks, uh, days, and sometimes weeks to, to research. And I've met uh, the startup, the governor officer, the university academics, and everybody to try to see uh, what were the problems, what are the, uh, the uh, opportunities, the difficulty, the threats, and so on and so forth. Skolkovo is uh, the main project of the Russian government about the internet. It is uh, uh, city, I mean, I shouldn't use the, te the name city. Right now, it's basically not even a village, 40 miles basically uh, from Moscow in, in Russia. Uh, when I wanted to go there, uh, the bus didn't work. <laughs> it took me three hours to arrive in the middle of a place where, it, where basically you had the, the Russian flag, some police guys, and nothing. It was just a process of beginning a city. Actually, they were finishing one building. It's supposed to be like a 100 building uh, uh, area in a few years. And uh, when I visit the place, uh, it was just the beginning. W one building was, was created. And actually, uh, the idea was to put uh, all the big corporations that, uh, that have a link with the government, all startups, and big firms, universities, and also some public government building in this Kolkovo city outside of Moscow to create the first Russian real smart city. And it has to be, of course, very green, so with like no cars, or everything will be with light trains and bicycles. By the way, it's 30 degrees below zero in the winter there, but. Uh, uh, bicycle, we'll see. We will see what will be the outcome of that. And um, I was very surprised by, by this project. First of all, because uh, Moscow and Russia is pretty good on the internet already. You have websites uh, like Ozon or Contact. Contact is a kind of Facebook. Uh, Ozon, it's more Amazon. That are, uh, or, or yes, Amazon or that are already extremely important. That they, s they have tons, tons of uh, products that are sold and, uh, and many connections, uh, I mean, millions of uh, connections every day. So when I also went to speak with the people in Contact, in Ozon, and in all the biggest uh, company, web company uh, in, uh, in, in the city of Moscow, they were very suspicious about the Skolkovo project, saying, okay, if the government wants, we probably will have to go, at least one of our office. But they were very happy to stay in Moscow. Why going to a place where for now at least there is no even train, no even subway, which is uh, in the middle of, the, of nowhere, with like, uh, it's, it's very cold in Moscow, but it will be even more cold, I mean colder in this uh, area. And then you speak to the startup, and the startup says, you know, we are very happy in Moscow. I mean, we can go in cafe, we can see each other, even though we are not in the same building. Why having us all together in this place? So, of course, the government has a lot of money. It's like uh, millions of, uh, of dollars that will be used to attract the startups. The, every startup that we have that is at quarter on Skolkovo will get uh, an important stipend, an important amount of money 
and uh, um, no, no taxes and all these kind of things that you can uh, maybe uh, uh, have to pay when you stay in Moscow. So this is really a project of a smart city. In a sense, it's not a smarter city, it's really a smart city because you create something from scratch, a new city. So we'll see. It's just the beginning. Medvedev and Putin has made uh, Skolkovo as their main project. Uh, it was supposed to be open uh, uh, last year already. It, it is not. Uh, we'll see if it's going to be open next year, uh, how it's going to work. It's interesting to see uh, the project. On one side, some people that are pretty, um, I would say, um, pragmatic says that in Russia it has to work like that. You don't work in Russia with this kind of uh, uh, spirit like in Israel where everybody does what he wants in his own place. It has to be centralized in a single place. So people think that might be the solution for, for Russia. Actually, you remember also that during the Cold War, they were created this kind of scientific cities sometimes in the very protected, sometimes they weren't even existing on the map because it was secret where they, they were developing uh, nuclear facilities and all this kind of thing. So this is like a reminder of this kind of closed uh, scientific gate cities that were very famous in the 50s or in the 60s. But we are not in the Cold War anymore. Another point of view uh, made by people that are more the startup guys. When you go to Moscow, you're, you're extremely, uh, you see how the, 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 the internet life is booming. You have tons of websites, startups, bloggers, uh, social networks, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the censorship and the difficulties to, to be free and to accept uh, uh, the the dissent, to accept contradiction, to accept media against the government, is also uh, much bigger now than before. So it's like uh, a catch-22 in, in a way, because you want more startup, but at the same time, you don't accept uh, the freedom of expression, you don't accept uh, creativity in a way that sometimes helps also the, uh, the startup to, to develop. So everything has to be taken in, in account, and we will see what's going on uh, with this project. My last example, it's another smart city uh, built uh, that is built from, from scratch in Kenya. So we are in Nairobi, close to Nairobi, I mean close. It's about one hour drive from Nairobi in a place named Konza City. And the Konda city, for now, it's the savanna. So basically, I've seen uh, zebra and giraffe, <laughs> but no startups there until now. So the government uh, wants to put all the startups in Konda city and create a highway to go there, and uh, like uh, even maybe some uh, cable uh, f for to, to get internet in a very speed way, and so on and so forth. And um, the government, uh, which is a very authoritarian one, asked the startup to go there. I mean, for now they are waiting, but everybody has to go in uh, Kansas City. And this is a very uh, strange project, even probably stranger than, than the, the one in, in, in Russia, because, uh, I mean, as you probably imagine, uh, Nairobi is not, uh, I mean, it's not. Uh, uh, a very easy city. I mean, it's for many, pr you have problems of water, problem for electricity, you have difficulty uh, with the road, traffic. So basically, building a new city like Kansas City, uh, when you have already s numerous problems and extremely difficult uh, problem to, to create a, a vibrant uh, digital life, it is uh, something maybe too big for a country like this one. At the same time, I was very surprised how Kenya, it was true also in South Africa, but South Africa is of course a different mo country and a much more developed one. Uh, I've seen that also in Cameroon or 
or in some other African country. But the, it, when you're in Kenya, you're very surprised how uh, the startups are also booming. All of them are linked to the, to the phone. In, 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 in Africa in general, especially in East Africa, uh, you access the internet through uh, the phone. And uh, even though it's now, a, as I said yesterday, a basic phone, uh, feature phone, it's not a smartphone, uh, they are extremely smart without the smartphone to make your basic phone smart. So for example, they create M-PESA, M-PESA, which is M-P-E-S-A. M-PESA, it's an incredible thing, and actually I use it to see how it works. So you take a basic phone, very basic, like uh, the Nokia 1121, uh, which is very cheap now, and uh, you, um, you op open an account on M-PESA, uh, then you put some money on it, uh, in any cash register, and you have like thousands of them, even in the slums. So you put the money in your account, and then when you want to buy something, you send an SMS through your phone to the till number of the shop. They got the SMS with the amount of money. You have a reply, they accept, you accept, and it's done. And I, uh, in Kenya, I was paying everything with my phone. In Kenya. We are in Kenya. Africa. Even in the slum, where they don't have water, where they don't have electricity, they pay everything with their smartphone, with, with their basic phone, sorry. And, uh, you know, whatever, you have a taxi, the guy, you, you pay with, with your, your M-PESA account, you pay two, uh, I don't know what is, I don't remember the, uh, the currency, like, I don't know, it's even 0.5 dollars, uh, it's nothing. You want a coffee, you pay with your M-PESA phone. And, it's especially used for micropayments for small amount of money uh, because I think the, the, minim the maximum you can, you can put on your account is about $700. Uh, $700 uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot for, for Kenya, but still it's not too, too big. You cannot buy a car with that. And uh, it's extremely important, for example, also to give the money to, to your family. Uh, until now, quite often the people from Kenya come from the villages, they arrive in slum, they try to, you know, to move on, and they find a job, and when they have a little bit of money, they give the money back to their family. Until now, they were using, basically, they were taking the, the money, like the notes, the cash, uh, using a, a matutu, matutu is a bus, uh, they give the money to the driver, and the matutu, after two or three days, arrive in the village, and sometimes, if everything was working well, the driver was giving the money to the family. Now it takes two seconds through the M-PESA account, you give the money to your family, that's it. Uh, I was also sh shocked, because it's extremely efficient, by uh, the, the map they were creating also uh, in, in Kenya. They were doing, you know, Google Map works everywhere, but Google Map is not very accurate in slums, because uh, you don't have a Google car that goes on the slums, and they don't know very well what's going on in the slum. Or in the slum, there is important things. Where is the water? And the water changes every day. Uh, where you can find uh, an M-PESA uh, office. Where you can find uh, uh, the police uh, check, and so on and so forth. So they built the map where the Google map doesn't go. And they do by themselves. Uh, every day they change the location of the things in comparison where, where there is uh, something that the water uh, uh, arrive in this area, so they put the sign, now it's here, now it's here, and so on and so forth. I was amazed, uh, uh, um, and the application of that is Ushaidi. Another application is M-Farm, uh, which is mobile farm. So it's a place, it's an application where you can get uh, in accurate, uh, accurate information about the price, and I spoke a little bit about that yesterday, of fruit and vegetables. So basically you know that today, for example, uh, <coughs> let's say bananas cost, I don't know, on the market that such a price. Then the farmer is able to sell his banana at the right price. And if the merchant says, oh no, today it's not, uh, you, you cannot, uh, I cannot pay that because uh, it's less expensive today, they say, no, I see, uh, the price today is this one. Uh, 
So they create many applications like that that are used on basic phone, which is not a smartphone once again, that uh, helps people to uh, to change their life in a in a very open way. So to summarize what I've seen, what I've said uh, uh, about uh, this kind of smart cities, um, I don't believe uh, on such a big project that are created by government that will decide to say, okay, we are going to open a smart city. Sometimes it can work when there is an history of that, when there, the place uh, has been for a long time uh, something important for, like, uh, like Porto Digital, where for a long time it has been uh, uh, already something. The importance of place in on the internet is extremely important. We, we can again think that internet is just a global uh, uh, thing without any link to any territory. Do you say that, territory? Um, I, I don't think it is like that. I think internet is always linked to a territory, always linked to the place, and even though you are in the global uh, network, the place has a very strong importance. This is why Bengaluru has been uh, so successful. This is why the Israeli model is totally different and adapted to the, to the Israel way of doing things. This is why Porto Digital, which is linked to a place, uh, I think works pretty well. And this is why so far, until now, I don't really believe in that this kind of big Skolkovo project in Russia or the Konda City project in uh, in Kenya. I think you cannot decide for the startup where they have to go, decide for the big company where they have to open their offices. And in any way, I think you cannot really uh, dream of rebuilding a Silicon Valley by yourself, uh, by a, a top-down decision made by governments. It has to be bottom-up, as we say, uh, from the ground up, and then uh, this is basically uh, my, my quick analysis of these several examples that I gave you. Once again, there is tons of other examples. Uh, I've seen al oh, at least 50 other smart cities in the world, in Helsinki, in Sevilla. Uh, there is uh, one in N Amsterdam, of course, London Tech City. Uh, in Paris, we, we have one. Uh, Chilicon Valley in Santiago de, Ch de Chile. Uh, there is uh, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan. Uh, everybody, everywhere wants to create his smart city, uh, which is sometimes a creative city, sometimes an industry, cultural, and they have several names. Sometimes you call it techno blurb. Sometimes you say edge city. I mean, there is many ways to call them, uh, but basically it's, it's a f global phenomenon. And uh, I believe it's a good thing to go in this direction, but it has to be done in a smart way and in a very, uh, I would say, um, careful way. Maybe some, uh, some quick, uh, some exchanges or on question or maybe more commentaries on this uh, first part? Yeah, I have two questions. The first one would be, who would be the startups in, in Russia? Isn't the government controlling everything? That, that would be like, it's Google going to go there or uh, that will be interesting. And the second one, it's it's more with the Kenya example, where we see that being smart is not only to create business, but to put technology for the use of the whole city. And that will make it really intelligent. Uh, because we know that, for instance, um, what you said about the phone is so, uh, so practical, and there's technology for, for instance, you can, you, your telephone, your, your mobile phone can be used as a credit card and, and a chip in, in, in the cell phone can, by just passing by a tunnel or, or a sort of a bridge in a supermarket, it reads everything you 
bot and it takes the money out of your cell phone. So do you think that it's this sort of smart cities will someday be possible or real? That will be the, the second question. Uh, on the, the Russia system, um, you know, Russia is a, is a mix of, uh, I mean, it's typically uh, typical of the post-Soviet uh, socialist society. It's a mix of uh, authoritarian regime with uh, a lot of uh, control by the government and at the same time an ultra-capitalist system. So in a way, it's a mix of China and, uh, I would say, and uh, the worst of the US. Uh, in general, the company are pretty private, and the startups are all really made by people that are totally independent of the government. Uh, and quite often, they live to the US. And don't forget that the founder, the founder of Google, is, uh, is from Russia. Uh, and you know, you create a Skolkovo project, but it has been probably better to keep this kind of guy, Sergey Brain, at home instead of having him creating Google in the US. But uh, that's also the problem of immigration, uh, of like the, the ability to keep your talent and the ability of the US to, uh, to accept the talent from other countries. Uh, it's another subject. At the same time, uh, the government is very influential within the control of the company, especially the big one, like Ozone, Contact, uh, all the social network, all the, I mean, when it's business, they don't really care about the control of information, of course. But when it's information driven, censorship is within the corporation. For example, mail.ru, which is the equivalent of Yahoo, is, totally co is very, really controlled by, by the government. But the startups are private. I mean, uh, everybody can create a startup. Uh, on Skolkovo, you can come, but you, ha you have to be Russian. You, 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 you can have investment from outside, but uh, the majority of the capital has to be Russian. Otherwise, you cannot get the money. So, uh, so it, it is a way to, I mean, I think also Russia goes toward a little bit China on this idea of uh, not having Google and Facebook and Twitter, but creating its own. And at the same time, uh, they don't have the, the, I mean, they are right, real behind China on, on, on that capabilities. Uh, other questions? Reactions? Yes? Um, uh, thank you for, for your lecture. Uh, my doubt is, is this internet trend important because it's an internet thing or because it's just a new part of economy that is going to the cities to revitalize economy because it's a new way of doing business. Is it really because it's internet or it's just because it's money? I think the answer is in your question, in a sense that you, you know already the answer. I, I really think that it is economy. It is the future of the economy. And internet is just, uh, I mean, a new technology in at large with also biotechnology and, uh, you know, green technologies and uh, all the other things and cloud and so on and so forth are, uh, uh, this is not just internet. It is uh, larger than that, of course. But the, like the follow up part of the question would be like, if, con why countries are investing so much to get other big companies from other countries go and colonizing them. Because you you put so much money, not to develop, but to get Google to go there. The goal of a smart city in general is not to have Google coming home. It's in general to create the next Google. I mean, at least they think that. Uh, and interesting things was, for example, in Santiago de Chile, they they had a, a kind of good ideas, a uh, good idea, which is you have a lot of students from anywhere, India, China, uh, Mexico, uh, and Chile, that have been very good students in Stanford, for example, or in Berkeley. So they, they have been extremely successful. 
they have done their MBA or whatever, and they created some project, but they weren't able to get a green card. So the Chile said, okay, come, we give you the green card. I mean, for Chile, but still. And basically, which nobody else have done, they, they took the talent that were, that, that graduate from U American universities to have them coming to Chile to create their startups only for one year, and then they do whatever they want, they can leave, and uh, they get a lot of money. So it was a way to attract the talent that the US basically uh, trained, but didn't keep. So I think it was a smart idea, and the project is called Startup Chile, what we call uh, the Chilicon Valley, <laughs> which is a little bit f funny. I mean, I, w I think it was the, the economists that used the Chilicon Valley expression for the first time. And it's in Santiago de Chile, if you go there, it's uh, uh, two or three buildings in the middle of the city, extremely nice. You see the Andes in the just behind you. I was there like two weeks ago. A reaction, yes? Um, thank you for the talk. Um, my question will follow up with that. You know the importance of characters like Robert Noyce and Schottky in the creation of the Silicon Valley and the creation of new technologies. Uh, and you are talking about that the US creating uh, professionals that have the capacity and the know-how to create this technology, but aren't keeping it. Um, shouldn't the country develop more people with the know-how to create this uh, new technology or the new trend in the future to create a big company like Google? I, I didn't get, sorry, the, so you, can you, I didn't get the question. Okay. Um, I, I got what you said, but not the question. Okay. Should the country, instead of focusing on on the startup and bringing the opportunity, shouldn't they also uh, support the creation of the professionals or the? You mean the people and not the startup? Yeah. I mean okay. more the people and than the startup? Do you think? Yeah, a, a balance, a more, because right now we don't have a great percentage of people uh, dedicated to uh, new ideas or new technologies. Oh. Yes, I mean, I I think you're right in a, in a, a startup doesn't exist without uh, someone that get an idea and that uh, and actually that fail and fail again and then succeed one day. Uh, failure is very important, what we call the failure system in, in the US. You know, in France, when you failed, nobody wants to speak to with you for, for 10 years. In the US, okay, you failed, good. Now we, I give you more money and you do something else. I mean, it's a little bit caricatural because it's not uh, that easy even in the US, but still the failure ability to accept failure, it's a part of, this, of the story. But to answer more your question, I would say Yes, I mean, it's of course uh, a man, I mean, somebody that is the key factor. Um, and this is how actually it's also important to accept somebody different, somebody crazy, somebody that is not thinking like the other way, you know, how you think, how you are a maverick, how you are thinking out of the box, as we say. And uh, how you nurture that, how you are able to accept this kind of kids is also part of the, I mean, of your question, uh, of the answer of the problem. And, um, you know, I, I don't, uh, there is many things I don't like in the US, but one thing where they are pretty good is to accept dissent. I mean, from, again, the hippies movement to the, to the you know, gangster rap and whatever you can imagine how you are at the same time uh, an extremely mainstream, to take the title of my book, mainstream, you know, everybody uh, uniform in of uniformized, uniformized, <laughs> difficult to say that also in English for me. Um, this is the US, but counterculture, experimentation, taking risk, uh, doing research and development uh, are extremely important. And by the way, I come back on what I said yesterday, I don't think, in this, in this sense, I am um, 
I'm not a pure, uh, how we call like a market driven guy. I don't believe the market is able by itself always to create these opportunities. I don't think the government will, will do it either. But I think this is why universities are extremely important. This is why the non-profit sector is extremely important, where you can try things without assuming the risk of the failure. And if you look at the US system, you are not able to understand the internet story. You're not able to understand Hollywood, Broadway, um, the, the video game industry, if you don't see that a la for a large part, uh, the, the risk, the, the, the way you train people, the, way, the place where you do experimentation, the place where you, you, you take risk, where you're original, where you're different, is within universities, within non-profit sector, within this kind of incredible counter society that still exists even in the more you know, economic driven society. And this is actually what the Chinese didn't get. This is actually what the Russian didn't get. Because they think it's just a question of money, of military, or, or art power, or, or these kind of things. They, they fail to understand that the guy, the guy you were talking about, the guy that is going to create the startup, he has the power. If he's not happy, because I don't know, because he's a woman in Iran and they don't accept women, because he's uh, crazy and the communist regime doesn't accept him, because he's a gay and they don't like gay or whatever, he will go away. And then the creativity will go away as well. So, the, the, again, there is many problems in the US, but at least this different guy, it's also a question of uh, diversity. You know, if you're a Mexican in France, you are Mexican which means that you, it's very difficult to integrate yourself. The same if you're from Russia, the same if you're from, from Africa. If you're a Mexican in the US, <laughs> you know, it's very, you're an American. If you're an Indian in the US, you're, you're an American. So it's also the question of how, at the same time, you accept difference, singularity, to create, uh, to create a different uh, way to help, uh, uh, also to create the startups after that. I have a question. Can I make a question? Um, uh, perhaps this is a total different approach, but um, do you consider that, like going back to the example you talked about Kenya and all these investments that are being done by governments on new technologies, on smart cities, and all of this, um, well, technological uh, approaches, would you consider this would jeopardize other problems that or other main issues that are happening in countries, for example, you mentioned the lack of water or light or even um, like uh, quality life um, for people in those kind of countries in Africa or I don't know Russia or whatever. Would you consider it jeopardizing? Because like focusing on technology, it it is a good thing, but perhaps it won't solve other main issues uh, of the country. So. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the question is right uh, to the point. Uh, I think um, th this debate uh, is extremely strong, especially in poor country like typically Kenya or even in India, uh, <coughs> when the gov <coughs> government pour uh, million of uh, dollars to uh, to to attract uh, um, startups when you don't ha don't even have water uh, like two miles away, it's of course always a, a problem. But I will give you another example, which I didn't use uh, yet, but which also very amazing for me. Uh, it's what they call the identity, unique identity digital card in India. Basically the project, which is based in B Bangalore, uh, is uh, to create an ID, digital ID. Because you might not know that, but there is uh, not such a thing as a digital I uh, as an ID like for everyone in India, and it's true also that uh, uh, it's a very big country, as you know, one point one billion point three hundred million people, and a lot of them have the same name. So, like the Frederick Martel, you have like uh, 
1,000 Frédéric Martel in India. I mean, with Indian names, of course. So nobody knows exactly who is who. And uh, a lot of things in India are linked to when you are in poverty in school, you have vote vote share to that the government gives you to uh, to be able to eat, to be able to go to school, and so on and so forth. So it's a big mess with a lot, a lot of problems of corruptions and all these kind of things. So the idea was to create an ID for every Indian. Everyone will get one. And the ID is a very simple thing. It's not even a, a, a document. You don't need it. It's a number. The number is on the card, but you don't even need the card. You need the number. The number is created when you go to the office. Uh, and right now, they have already 400 million people on the ID system, and they will finish probably it in two years. So it's a, one of the most interesting digital uh, project uh, of this time. So you go there, you give your name, your surname, your date of birth, and your print, uh, how do you say that, the finger printer for the 10 um, things, and the iris of your eyes. With the name, they have 80% chance that you are alone. With the fingerprints, 99. With the iris of the eyes, 99.9. So basically, every Indian will be alone with a real name and a real uh, ability. And then this card that says only that. And basically, you can go to many offices everywhere to get the number. And also, they, they have like cars that are going to villages. You know, there is more than 100,000 villages in India. So it's like very difficult to, to speak to anyone. They go with cars and these kind of things. And then they do their printer things, finger printer, in, in these kind of cars everywhere in the country. Then the bank account. The security social, the social security, uh, all the f the voucher that you get for schools and so on will be linked to this number. So it's an incredible, crazy project. Of course, there is tons of privacy issues, tons of people that say it might be difficult. But once again, the, the car doesn't really exist. You just have a number. The number just say you are the person you say you are. All the other things are not put within the number. The banks use this number for your account, but the, the data from the bank is not linked to the card. It is in the bank. The same thing for health. All the data you, you use for your, you know, whatever um, things you link to the health, uh, specific issue to yourself, are the doctor has that, but with your number and so on and so forth. I spoke to probably, I don't know, 200 people in India about that. I spoke to to little guy that already have the number, uh, to to government that were, were doing that, to the guy who thought of the project, to the digital people that are still uh, st keeping the data secure in Bangalore. I spoke also with famous doctors that think that it is going to save the people about health, and they really believe in the project. Some others that are exactly like you, thinking, you know, the people are not uh, enough money to eat. How are you going to spend billions of dollars to create these cards? So this is always a debate between, do you need to create this such a crazy project? Does it going to work or not? You know. We'll see. Again, I wrote one chapter of my book on about this ID digital uh, card. I mean, let's see uh, in the next one, two or three years. Who, first of all, if it's going to be uh, to, to be finished, because it doesn't make sense if you just have 30% uh, of the population with this kind of ID. Uh, it has to be maybe not uh, everybody, absolutely everybody, but at least a large number of people. By the way, Every people that lives in India can get it. If you live abroad, you cannot. But you, if you're a foreign person, you can get it within India. And uh, if you, um, uh, for example, what was the, the story? And uh, you can, uh, th there is a lot of problems when you create this kind of system. So we, I spoke for weeks with them, you know, how you get the people, how you, uh, and uh, uh, when you have two people with the same, um, uh, I mean, les, les, how do you say les jumeaux en anglais? 
Les twins, yes. Twins, people who don't have uh, uh, eyes, for example, because they are uh, disabled. People, I mean, there is many stories. But at least at the end, you will, you will have a database, maybe the biggest uh, in the world, of uh, uh, 1 billion 300 million people and 2 billion 600 eyes. So it's going to be a pretty uh, big project. Another last... Uh, before I go to the last, uh, to the second um, comment, yes. Then the question is about Mexico. Um, you know. Once again, when you do this kind of research, if you want to make a book that is at least a book that you can read, uh, you're not going to, I mean, you're not going to, to make like country after country and to make, uh, uh, I would say, um, um, uh, a synthesis of everything in every country. So you need, uh, this is more like the journalist that speaks uh, right now, <coughs> you need a story. So the ID card is a story. So then you, you get there and you, you take that. So in Mexico, uh, I've been working on two subjects which are part of my research. One was the question of concentration on uh, the, the telephone company, so basically Slim, Carlos Slim's uh, sector. Uh, so I met with uh, Carlos Slim Jr. We uh, spent a lot of time on looking at uh, at the slim um, monopoly, uh, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm a very uh, pro market economy person, but I do think that market economy needs competitions. So there is not other way to um, to be able to to have a better uh, communication sector and high speed everywhere and everything without competition, it, it won't work. Uh, so that's that basic. And the second things I, I used, I mean, w I worked a little bit in such area like Monterey and like uh, Veracruz uh, on the how you get some information on the internet when the journalist cannot write about some subjects, typically narco-traffickers. So th they were my two stories about Mexico. But I didn't work on everything. So. Uh, for example, the smart uh, smart cities. It's not. I haven't worked on that in Mexico. Maybe I should have done that, but uh, I didn't. Okay. So now I want to um, to leave the. I would say a little bit the the rich subject to go on the more poor one. Even though we already spoke about the the ghettos in Kenya and also some other places. I want to speak about revitalizations, uh, basically how internet can be used in favela, township, ghettos, what you call zonas, uh, zonas de miserias, barrios, uh, slum, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to focus on some examples, and the first one will be in Brazil, uh, where I spend a lot of time um, with the people of Viva Favela, with the people of the Center for Digital Inclusion, Grupo Cultural, and also the CESC <coughs> in uh, a dozen cities in, in Brazil. But before that, I would like to begin by tell you, tell, telling you a little bit uh, how we see this issue uh, sometimes. I had a fight <coughs> two years ago when my book, uh, Mainstream, was published, I had a kind of fight, friendly fight, uh, with a famous writer uh, from Latin America, uh, Vargas Llosa, who wrote uh, a very long chapter on his own book to answer my own book. And he was pretty friendly with me, but he was basically saying that uh, the culture I was uh, describing, entertainment, mass culture, globalization, uh, is not the culture he would like for the future. So basically he was uh, thanking me to write about that, and again he was pretty friendly, so it wasn't a fight, a mean fight, but at the same time basically saying, uh, I don't want to see this world, the world I'm describing. 
And I had exactly the same story with some French intellectuals. I remember one, uh, it's Alain Finkielkraut, also Marc Fumaroli, which are very famous you know, classic French intellectuals. And one of them, Marc Fumaroli, wrote one page in uh, Le Figaro, which is a very conservative uh, and famous newspaper in France. And he said, this guy in mainstream wrote a wonderful book. He met thousands of people in the world. I love that but I wouldn't have met these people. He just doesn't like entertainment, he doesn't like mass culture, he doesn't like the internet. Because for these people, this kind of people, internet is entertainment. Internet is, you know, cats doing uh, some, uh, how do you say? Voilà, funny stuff, or uh, do you say, ils font du patin à roulette, uh, ou de la planche à roulette, Skateboard, I mean cats on skateboards. They think internet is a place where you have fun with your friends uh, on, uh, on Facebook. They think internet is something futile, something not serious, something just uh, uh, for fun. When you are in a favela in Brazil, when you are in Kibera in Kenya, when you are in a ghetto, in a slum, in a bidonville, you see how internet is not something for fun. So they are wrong. Internet can change the life of people. It can, it can help you to, to escape the poverty. It can help you to leave the favela, to leave the Kibera ghetto, to have a better life. And this is basically what I'm going to talk to you now. So I've been in probably a dozen of favela in Brazil with the people of Viva Favela, CDI and others. And I try to understand how internet can help you. Uh, there is in, in Brazil, and maybe it's also the case in Mexico, what we call land houses. Land houses, it's a kind of cyber cafe but uh, even though tonight, today they are really cyber cafe, before they weren't really cyber cafe in the sense that all the computer in the land house wasn't uh, linked to the internet. Actually, only one was linked to the internet and the other one were built on land, which, which means local uh, connection and not internet connections. And land houses have been uh, extremely uh, popular in favelas all around Brazil in the last 10 years. So basically you were able to come to this place to get, and more step by step it became more linked directly to the internet, a place where you can play video games, of course, or entertainment, but also where you were able to uh, do your CV, your curriculum vitae, where you can find some information, about jobs, uh, communicate with other people. And so basically the programs, and there is numerous of them, were based on using land houses on to empower people. The main word is the main word is empowerment. And you know the expression probably. Empowerment means to give the power, to give back the power of people, which is <coughs> Again, a very, um, a very bottom-up idea. It's not the government that basically helps you. It's the way you help yourself, but you need, you need the internet for that. And I've seen the, the CDI, for example, Center for Digital uh, Inclusion, that, uh, that train people f on that. And they, they, they organize the internet, internet session uh, to 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 work on the internet uh, in many places, and uh, uh, the the evolution of that is, and as I told you that yesterday, how you we, we were for a long time thinking of the digital divide, the digital divide, uh, it's how you can access the internet to what we call today digital um, literacy which means how you are able to use uh, the internet. So it's not just the access, because once again, I think the access will be in the next five or 10 years, 
probably um, uh, accessible. I mean, it will work. But how, even when you access, you are able to work more on uh, the internet. So the question of the digital literacy is a question of how you uh, help the people to use the internet on a better way to uh, create jobs, to create, um, to know uh, more about uh, what you can do and so on and so forth. The question is how, uh, how it works and does it work basically? Does at the end people were able to be more, uh, um, I mean, uh, able to, to live, for example, a favela, to be able to more, be more, uh, um, uh, to go from, from the um, poverty to a more middle class. And of course, it's very extremely difficult to, to answer th this question. Uh, as you know, in Brazil, uh, and it's maybe a little bit the case like e e here in Mexico, they, they organize, they think the society in several classes, A, B, C, D, E, basically. Uh, the A is a very rich one, the B is like also very rich, C it's like the middle class, what we call in general upper middle class, D it's like the lower middle class, and E, D and E are basically the, the favelas, like the people in poverty. We know also that in the last 15, 15 years, Brazil was able to get basically 50% of its population uh, becoming C-class. So basically, uh, Brazil now it's a country of middle class. And um, the DEE classes are uh, basically only one anymore. And the B class is like much bigger, 50% of the population, and the B and A are still limited to, to more rich people. And actually one part of the student demonstration and the difficulties uh, currently, but also last year, are because of the C class basically is blocked and cannot go to the B class, so it's like a limitation and they are like, the, the, the social ascension that they were expecting is a little bit stopped and they are not that happy by, by that and uh, for one part the analysis of the, uh, the student movement and the social movement are linked to this uh, limitation of the, of the C-class. But whatever uh, are the reason of the demonstrations, uh, it's true that uh, the Brazil uh, had a lot of people uh, leaving poverty to access on a better, better life. A lot of analysis um, in the IMF, uh, President Lula, President Dilma Rousseff or others thinks technology at large, uh, internet or also phone, have been an important player of this mobility, social mobility from uh, D and E class to the B class. Um, of course, it's extremely difficult to, to, to be sure about that. But the reason why they believe uh, um, it works, uh, it's because uh, through, um, and they even made some calculations, some, some analysis that when you get 10% of your population accessing, for example, mobile phone, then the level of poverty will, will decrease for a certain percentage. I'm not always very uh, sure about this kind of analysis and this kind of numbers, but it's true that the Brazil had an extremely uh, important development in the last uh, 15 years. What is the exact part, exact part of technologies and uh, I would say um, um, internet in this development? It's again very difficult to say. But I do believe uh, it was an important uh, uh, factor. What do you think about that? Who here has any idea of the, the way technologies can play a role in uh, um, ability, your ability to, uh, to develop a country, to develop your own life? Do you believe in these kind of things? 
or do you think it's just like uh, communications by the big uh, internet uh, corporations? Oui. Oui. Well, I think that it's obvious that access to technology and especially to the internet develops a society because internet is endless information. It's access to everything. Just the, the device that gives you access to that amount of information and well, develops you, gets you out of, first of all, ignorance or a level of ignorance. So that develops everything from your personal life to a country's economy. That's, and that's why censorship is so dangerous. Who else uh, can, maybe you? And maybe you, if you disagree, you're also welcome to say something. I'm very open on this subject because, you know, I'm a researcher. I go, I listen to people, I see the things, they give me the numbers. I mean, I trust things and I'm kind of optimistic, so I believe <coughs> It works, but you know, who knows? Okay, um, you s you have those uh, analysis that bringing technology to people increases the development, but I don't have you proven that? Has a test study has been done in a subject where the technology is introduced, or are we just seeing a cause and effect correlation that isn't sustained? You, you're exact, exactly right. This is a debate. I mean, there is ton of analysis that try to confirm, to prove uh, these kind of things. But once again, uh, um, uh, you know, w when you have uh, um, such a, um, a development, what are the factors, the key factors? My hypothesis is probably that internet and new technology are one of them. Not the only one. It's not because you open uh, internet in a favela that suddenly the favela will be uh, happy and everybody will, will become rich. Of course not. But in a, in a m very complex multi-task, uh, I mean, uh, things you do, the new technology and the phone, especially the phone, and then internet uh, bringing to the people has some effects. But has anyone done the study or...? got a group to see if it's true or is there Yes, they else? have done this kind of research. Especially if you're interested in that, the CDI, which is Center for Digital uh, Inclusion in Brazil, it's easy to find their website. I was with them two weeks ago in Brazil, uh, three weeks ago in Brazil, uh, are extremely, uh, I mean, efficient on the studies and so on. But of course, being the CDI, they are not going to say what we are doing uh, has no effect. You know, they they work for, but I mean, for example, President Lula was very suspicious about that in the beginning of his uh, mandate, and at the end, he was speaking only about that. You know, internet will revit revitalize our favelas and and so on and so forth. So actually, they made a lot of plans and money, uh, encouraging this kind of uh, this kind of things. In a way. It's pretty dif different, and I don't want to go too much on, on politics uh, uh, during this seminar, but it's also the question of uh, um, the Arab Revolution in a different way. Uh, for example, we had a, a very long debate. For example, Michael Gladwell, uh, which I don't necessarily like, wrote a, a very interesting piece, article, uh, the, I think in October 2011, a uh, small change in the New Yorker, you can read that, it's easy to find. Actually, it's a brilliant, brilliant article, like everything he writes. Small change, uh, Michael Gladwell, the New Yorker, probably October 2011, saying, uh, you know, internet uh, is good, but it's not going to change the world. Uh, if we would have had internet uh, in the time of Martin Luther King, we wouldn't have had the, the black revolution because internet creates links that are too small to really help you to change the world and so on and so forth. And there is other thinkers, numerous one, that says that internet can be as dangerous 
as it, it gives freedom that uh, state like Russia and China can be actually use internet for the bad and not for the good and so on and so forth. The reality is that two months after this article of Michael Gladwell, a little guy in south of Tunisia uh, was uh, killed himself, uh, you know, because of the uh, he was selling vegetables and the police didn't uh, uh, like that. And the video of him and all the things that arrived in Tunisia that, that week became the beginning of the Arab revolutions. And the Arab revolution were mainly made not on Twitter. I agree with a lot of people on that. I mean, if you go to Egypt today, if you go to Iran, you will see that the people don't use Twitter in general. But the video on YouTube, the Facebook pages, and maybe more than that, the SMS that the people were able to send to each other, because everybody has a, has a cell phone in Egypt, everybody has a cell phone in Tunisia, everybody has a cell phone in Iran, were an important part of this revolution. Though at the end, if you say it is a Twitter revolution, of course you're, you, you, it's a mistake. But if you say technology hasn't being part of the revolution, it's also a mistake. So it has been an acceleration, it has been an extremely important uh, factor to uh, multiply the effect of the, the video and I think YouTube and especially the video and some message on Facebook the in, in, in Egypt have been a, an important part of, uh, of this uh, revolution. And on, on my website, if you're interested in that, I, I have uh, um, at least 100 articles and books on this subject. And <coughs> in my <coughs> own book, uh, Smart, I have one chapter on Islam and on the revolution, Arab revolution. And I spend, uh, I mean, I've been in 15 uh, Arab countries for this research. I've been in Iran, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, and so on. And I went at least five times in Egypt, three, four times in Lebanon, uh, also in Gaza, in Tunisia, in, in, in Algeria, to try to understand what's going on on this issue. And I believe the phone, uh, mobile phone, <coughs> so social networks, and the internet are a, f this, uh, a, a clear changing factor in the Arab world. There, there is, or there was a long time ago, um, an analysis on the 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 effects of TV, because there was also debate during the the, the early 70s about the the bad effects of TV, and they discover that the difference in kids with color TV, black and white TV, and not TV, were very significant. The children that had color TV uh, were a little bit more intelligent than the other ones. So maybe this can... I'm not sure I will buy that, <laughs> but uh, uh, because I had a black TV when I was a kid, so... <laughs> <laughs> I have black and white TV. You know, we are in France. It's not a very modern country. Uh, I have a question about. Does it work? Yeah. yeah. The content that it gets introduced through the media and the technology platforms could be very beneficial and could be very harmful. So the question is how do we create filters that try to minimize? I'm not saying that it's possible to, to completely. Uh, eliminate, but how? What kind of filters do you think could be thought of to minimize the negative impact of the content going into the technology platforms that reach people? This is a this is a very good question because actually at the end this is the you know does internet is better or does he do more good or more more bad than than before? I mean, I, I saw some, I mean, I interviewed some people in Algeria, for example, saying, you know, the government use internet every day to spread rumors on the internet against, for example, the civil rights people or against, like, the people that want to help the human rights. Okay, 
But before the rumors were in the newspaper, organized and paid by the government, at least now you have the way to counter the rumors on the internet, even though they are spread by the government. Before it wasn't even possible because you, not, you were not able to create a newspaper to counter, uh, for, uh, to have the counter effect of the rumor. This is why <coughs> at the end, sorry, at the end I believe, um, I mean, I really believe that internet is not good or, by, or, or bad by itself. It, it will depend a lot of what we, I mean, you, me, uh, us together, and we are going to do with it. But at the same time, I think the, on a general view, it does more good than bad. This is my optimistic way to see uh, the internet. Another comment, comment maybe on the Arab Revolution or the use of the internet in uh, uh, favelas. Uh, hi. Uh, well, uh, have a couple, a uh, couple of comments. Uh, first of all, just to follow up a little bit, the, just uh, uh, um, the remark that uh, we just heard a minute ago. Uh, I do think that actually uh, it's very dangerous to have filters on the internet because, uh, I mean, um, in I, I know that exists a, a, a plethora of information on the on the web, and most of it it's uh, is not very serious, and some of it is very good information. But in any case, if um, if we are creating these forms of filters, the danger of censorship is is there. I mean, the shadow of censorship it's it's very clear in terms of power relations. So I do prefer to not to have filters. To, uh, even though we have the risk to uh, have this kind of very negative uh, messages. At the end, this is a space of information, and the, and the virtual world is nothing else than a mirror of the, or the, or the offline world. But in any case, uh, that's, that's one, uh, one comment. My other comment is uh, actually with something that you have started the second part of your, uh, of your lecture. Um, when you start talking about um, this criticism against uh, mainstream culture, uh, what I think, and actually it's not my own position, it's, it's part of a, a whole tradition in cultural studies, is that at the end, all kind of cultural product, it doesn't matter if this is a, a Shakespeare uh, play or a, a Mexican telenovela, it doesn't matter, all of them are subjected to a, 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 a power struggle. There's an ideological layers that exist in this particular product. So, Treat a mainstream culture, uh, and, and, and by the way, I do like a lot Vargas Llosa as a novelist, but he's a despicable guy as a politician, or is a, 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 a political comment. Uh, com uh, comment it's also uh, another generation. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, in, in any case, um, this is something that exists uh, because of this kind of canonical perspectives of what is considered to be art and what is considered to be popular. But at the end, it's the same, the same discussion that you're taking a, a minute ago too, that uh, since everything, uh, since this kind of mainstream culture or this popular culture is on the, pupil, on the popular level, it is considered as a, as a, as a, a, low, a, a, a low form of culture, so it's not considered a part of the, of the discussion, even though they can create a, a very interesting forms of of, of rejection against uh, certain dominant discourses. And the internet is great remixing information or remixing all this kind of uh, messages, uh, creating also these um, uh, uh, forms of resistance to, uh, as the, uh, those one that's happening uh, mainly in, in, in the Brazilian tradition, that is, well, Brazil is uh, probably one of the most uh, great examples in the use of, uh, 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 of these rem remix uh, uh, perspectives. Just, just, just a comment. Just a Another comment? He, he did answer to you, I think, but I don't want to mix up between professors, but uh, I don't encourage fight, uh, you know. By the way, I do believe, and it was already my one of my main uh, issue in, uh, in the book Mainstream, and it's uh, again the case with SMART, the next book, 
Uh, and it is why in France it was a debate, even though the book was well received, it has been also attacked a little bit by some elite, saying that, uh, you know, we, we cannot um, accept the idea of um, the hierarchy of culture disappearing. So the internet plays <coughs> an important role also on changing the hierarchy. This kind of hierarchy with like high heart uh, being the only one that are very serious and that you keep because they are universal and they will uh, be uh, important on a long way even though it's difficult to access the work but one day you will still have a label this kind of uh, romantic idea that you you have also in the Marxist tradition of the Ecole of Frankfurt and all these kind of things. You know, uh, which is a very European way of thinking about culture. It's not only French. I mean, you have that in Germany, you have that in Great Britain, of course. This is why they are so upset against the, the American language, for example. Uh, you have that in Spain, in Italy. It's a tradition of Europe. This tradition is not working anymore. I mean, Everywhere in the world, we believe that, even in France, even in the film studies, even in the academics, we believe that art can be, uh, can be a block blockbuster. We believe that, uh, uh, actually, uh, Star Wars uh, has been, for a long time, an important film. Uh, you like it or not, but uh, it's not something that will disappear and, and won't be uh, a, a, an important thing because of it's just commercial. So um, mangas and uh, and um, um, cartoons and uh, American series TVs, maybe even telenovelas. Uh, I mean, video games uh, can be art as well. So the idea of a hierarchy still exists, but this is not a hierarchy decided by this kind of elite that try to keep its power. I mean, I'm not a Bourdieuian uh, scholar at all for those who are interested in this uh, debate. But I do believe that uh, it's linked to a social status and that at the end, uh, the European way is not something you will have uh, in India, you will have in China, you will have even in Mexico, because it's a different way of thinking. And the European tradition uh, is lost in a way for, on, on this subject. I don't know if I'm very clear saying that, but yes? I just want to follow up on the favela, the questions or the comments on favelas. I'm an academic and I'm a researcher and I care about incomes and, and the, social, the social improvement, the social mobility. And so my concern is, and it's not filters as censorship, but filters as, as in eBay, when you know that in eBay a person that has uh, 150 sales is more trustworthy than a person that has two. It's not like you're saying that person is bad or good. You're just saying the record speaks for itself. I, I like finance, I like numbers, so the record should speak for itself. So in the sense, the favela, I think that the people who want to go to, to the level C, which is what we were talking about Brazil, you know, they, they would like to have trustworthy, actionable, quality information, not just whatever. That's, that was, that's why, where I want to ask you for your research. How does, you know, without being sounding moral or, or being God, I, I don't want to sound like a, a, a censor or a God, but how does one, you know, use the technology so that it creates an element of trust, so that whatever f goes through it becomes actionable and becomes positive for society? That, that's where I'm coming from. I, I, I hope that that clarifies the filters idea. You know, I, I believe uh, that um, this is an extremely important issue, how you, you can help these people, and, uh, and, can, and more important maybe, how they can help by themselves using things that you can brought to them. I was very surprised when I began to work on this kind of subject in, in the US, in ghetto. I, I've been in like the South South Chicago, in Watts LA, in the South Central, I mean, all the worst uh, black ghettos that are more and more Mexican ghettos, by the way, in, in the US. What used to be a black ghetto, now it's a, it's a Mexican ghetto. And uh, 
I was with people like, you know, the elite, uh, American elite, philanthropy, who, you know, all women, very rich, and uh, they go to the ghetto to, and, and they were saying, you know, we are going to bring technology there. And very quickly, it was like 10 years ago, very quickly you, re you realize that, I mean, the kids are 10 times better on technology than, than this woman. So they are not going to be helped uh, by, by this philanthropic woman that think they will bring uh, technologies to, to the ghettos because they are already extremely good in, on using it. The way, the, the way you help them is not uh, in a paternal, paternalistic way, it's not being like top down uh, once again, it's more on, uh, on seeing how they use themselves the things how you can create the website, create the, the tools that will, at the end, um, help the people to, uh, to get the information, to get network, uh, to be in a network, and so on uh, and so forth. But once again, uh, and maybe we, we, we will finish with that today, um, I mean, if I were a student here, if I were a Mexican student here, uh, and if I'm interested in basically all this subject, which is um, economic development, um, new technology, and how you create a, a successful business, how you create your startup, how you are able to um, to change the life of people for good, and by the way, to change your own life in the same time, at the same time. If I were you, I would spend. I know it costs money. I know you need visa. I know it's difficult, but you know it's possible. I will spend as much time as I can during the summer, during vacation, maybe for one year uh, without working, to go and to see what's going on. I mean, Mexico is one of these countries, probably more, uh, of course, uh, in advance to many others. But still, being in India and see how the startups are working, being in China and see how the people find a way to counter the censorship, being in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Lebanon to see how the people are able to create uh, applications that change uh, the way the, the old system was working, uh, being in Brazil and see how some people, some kids are helping favelas to change, being in Kenya and see how you can create mobile application that will change the life of the people, you know, I will spend, I'm too old for that, but if I were you, I will spend as many time as I w can now, right now. I mean, you will have the time to develop your own startup, you will have the time to become rich and famous, you will have the time to, to create more substantial business, but at least to see all these things. And using that to to understand how the world is changing and in which direction uh, things are um, going. This is just my, maybe my little message I want, what wanted to share with you uh, today. And tomorrow we will, I will go to something more, uh, you know, more modern, more less social, less economical and more cultural. And maybe we will go back on the question of hierarchy a little bit. We'll be on content, we'll be on curation, will be on actually filters and how you can um, you can uh, <coughs> use the internet for uh, for changing content and the future of culture future of media through the internet i thank you for your time uh, sorry for my english it's always difficult for a french to speak english but i've done uh, i've tried to do my best and i see you tomorrow i hope